Hi everybody, Geo here. This story is called Did I Dare? And it is a rewritten version of one of the stories from my other channel. A cleaned up version, you could kind of say. It's also a companion story to A Different Kind of Sexy. That story told Nick's point of view, and this story tells Brody's point of view. As you've probably guessed, it's about Brody and Nick's relationship. Let's go ahead and get started. Six o'clock on a Friday evening, and I pulled up to the Harris house. Amy Harris, my current date, lived with her parents. She had an older brother that didn't live at home, a dog, and a mom, and a dad, an old-fashioned, normal family. Amy and I were going to grab dinner at this gourmet burger place, then watch the play at the high school. It's put on by students. It's cheap. I could buy tickets at the door, and they usually do a good job. It was my old high school from four years ago, and I liked to support them when I could. My life was perfect. Everybody said so. Except me. If everything was so good, why did I feel like I was wasting my life? Did I dare dream of something different? An extra car was in the driveway, and another two were on the street. The Harrises had company. A sign in the window said, Welcome home, Nick. Nick was Amy's older brother, and I had never met him. I climbed out of the car and walked to the front door. Somebody, Amy's mom Carolyn, I think, yelled, I want the punch by the sofa and put the cookies on the coffee table. Amy, move the table over by the chairs and put the cookies on it. It must be perfect. Somebody tie up Cosmo. Mom, it's too heavy for me, Amy said. We need another table. Philip, grab the portable table from the den. The leg wobbles. Are you sure you want it? We have enough already, Philip said. It's not enough until I say it's enough, Carolyn said. I rang the doorbell. Nick's here already, places everybody, smiling faces, Carolyn squealed, and suddenly was at the door, holding the collar of Cosmo, their German shepherd. Carolyn's mouth made a huge smile that showed off all her teeth, and she yelled in a high falsetto voice, Nick, my darling baby, you've come home. Not exactly, ma'am, I said. Oh, you're not Nick. Her smile deflated a little, but she kept it pasted on. She scanned my hair, my pressed, button-down, long-sleeve white shirt, my pressed khaki slacks, and my polished shoes. She frowned and ruffled her fingers in my hair, slightly fixing it. I made sure I dressed right, so she wouldn't complain this time. I'm here to pick up Amy for our date, I said, though I don't think it's going to happen tonight. Brody, come on in. Didn't Amy tell you? she asked. She wore a new floral print dress and an apron that said, I'm in charge of this kitchen. She blinked her fake lashes as if to emphasize her words. No, ma'am. What's going on? I said. Amy stood behind Carolyn. She wore a new yellow sundress and a green necklace with matching shoes that I had never seen before. She had stylishly done her eyes in green mascara and fake lashes. I'm sorry, Brody but I forgot to tell you. My brother called earlier and is coming home tonight. He doesn't believe in advance notice, I asked. That's my rude brother for you. He texted from some airport in Chicago, grabbed a connecting flight to Vegas, and my cousin picked him up from the airport, Amy said. He's due any time now, Carolyn said. Mom, Brody can stay, right? There's plenty of food and we can catch the play next weekend. Amy said, grabbing my hand with her soft hand and gave me a big smile. Of course he can, Philip said, bringing in the portable table. He's practically part of the family anyway. When are you going to propose, Brody? Dad, don't embarrass me, Amy yelled and let go of my hand. That's all you and your mom talk about, he said. So why not ask? Of course I must have blushed because Carolyn patted my cheek. Actually, I think she was checking to see if I had shaved. Don't you worry. I'm sure Brody and Amy will get married within the year, 
May would be good. You two shouldn't wait too long to have kids. I want two baby girls to spoil. Of course, they'll need a proper house and a yard to play in. There is this house in the neighborhood up for sale. And Brody, it's never too early to think about your retirement and how you're going to take care of Amy. I was telling Amy the other day that once you graduate, I know a place that would hire you in an instant, and they are close by. I could come over and visit you and Amy any time. Mom's right. We shouldn't wait too long, and I like May too, Amy said, and lowered her head to shyly look at me while rapidly blinking her fake eyelashes. I tried not to roll my eyes. Kids, that's one thing Amy and I have not discussed as well as marriage. Obviously, they have discussed it. What else had they discussed? Did they have my entire life planned out? I forced my shoulders to relax and tried to keep my face pleasant. There's a car pulling up, an older woman said. I assumed it was Amy's grandmother. The older man must be her grandfather, and the other man and woman must be the aunt and uncle. That's Cliff's car, the man said. Let me see, let me see, Carolyn said. Who is that blonde man getting out? Mom, look closer. Can you believe what my brother did now? He dyed his hair. Amy said, her voice turning sour. I don't like it, the grandmother said. A man should never dye his hair. Look at what he's wearing, Caroline said. This is so embarrassing. I hope the neighbors don't see him. Look at him. He hasn't shaved, and I bet he smells like sweat, the grandmother said, emphasizing the word sweat as if she would have to confess it to her priest. You raised him, Caroline. This is your fault. How many times have Caroline and Amy looked out the window as I pulled up and had a similar conversation about me? Probably every time I came over. Part of me wanted to walk out the door and not look back. The guy that must be Cliff opened the trunk and pulled out a single suitcase. He wore a new jacket, crisp slacks, and a stylish polo. Cliff carried the suitcase to the house. Nick had blonde hair that hung to his shoulders, dark eyes, very tanned skin, and was lean. He wore cut-off denim shorts that ended halfway down his thigh and a loose-fitting, faded gray long sleeve shirt with a hood. The left elbow had a hole in it. His shoes? Old leather sandals held together with duct tape. He pulled on a very old and very battered backpack, also patched with duct tape. His smile revealed perfect teeth and a dimple on his cheek. He said something to Cliff, and they both laughed. Carolyn opened the door so wide it banged on the wall. Why, if it isn't my wayward son, Nick, she squealed. Cosmo ran out. Mom, close the door, Amy screamed. Catch that stupid dog, the grandfather said. Why do you even keep him? Running after the dog, I barged past the others and grabbed for the collar. I missed. The dog rushed to Nick. I lunged after the dog and almost caught his collar. The dog was fast and darted to the side. I tried again and accidentally tackled Nick. We fell, rolling a moment on the ground. Somehow, Nick was on top. Nick might be lean, but his body was sturdy and solid. His hair wasn't dyed blonde. It was sun-bleached. He had that casual dark stubble some guys can grow that always looked good. He didn't smell like sweat, but like sandalwood. And his clothes smelled of cinnamon. His hair hadn't been cut and styled in months, maybe even a year. His hands held me. They were strong, calloused hands that must have seen a lot of hard work. The best part? I had my arms around him. If I leaned in just a little bit, I could kiss his dimple, his lips. His breath smelled like cinnamon as well. Did I dare kiss him? Amy was supposed to be my girlfriend, so I better not. Nick smiled and he gave me a hug back even though I was on the ground. Cosmo barked. Carolyn screamed. Amy ran after the dog. Philip swore. Hi, I'm Nick, Nick said, laughing. His smile was genuine and his eyes sparkled. 
Getting tackled by a sexy guy is my idea of a perfect homecoming. Can I have your name and number? Nick, why do you have to be so rude? Amy yelled. I'm Brody. Blame the tackle on Cosmo. Got some paper, I said, and smiled back. Nick, hands off. That's Amy's boyfriend, Carolyn said. You can always tell when Cosmo is happy, Nick said, as if Carolyn hadn't interrupted. As soon as Nick mentioned his name, the dog jumped on us and licked us both and barked. Nick sat back, letting me up, and then he hugged the dog. I missed you too, Cosmo. The dog slurped Nick, then jumped on me. I got slurped, and both Nick and I laughed. Nick crawled to his feet, then gave me a hand up. Nick, it's so good to have you home, Amy's mom said, stepping to her son to give him a stiff hug that barely touched him. Soon, everybody clustered around Nick, except me and Cosmo. I scratched the dog's ears and took a breather while everybody ignored me. What did Nick think was so sexy about me? Was he only saying something off the spur of his brain, or did he mean it? I don't mind dating men, or women. In fact, I've dated both. Why limit yourself? Nick was cute. If you like the rugged, outdoors, self-sufficient type rolled into a body solid with muscles, and a grin that somehow brightened the room around him, did I dare tell him that he was sexier than his sister? That I liked him? I'd better settle down because he was Amy's brother. Nick caught me staring at him and gave me a chin lift. I half chuckled and gave him a chin lift back. I've cooked your favorites, the grandmother said, a finger smoothing out her false eyelashes. Sweet peas in a cream sauce, that applewood bacon you liked, which we'll put on our hamburgers, and sweet homemade pickles. And about a hundred potatoes of fresh fries, Cliff said. Guess who had to cut them all? Don't complain. I helped, the grandfather said. In seconds, we were in the backyard with the wonderful smell of fresh barbecue in the air and a deep fryer on another table sizzling away. Which country are you in now? Amy asked, but her voice became shrill and brittle. We've been building houses in this rural place in Africa. You wouldn't believe how poor it is. They don't even have running water. At least didn't until we installed a well and a windmill to bump it. Let me show you, Nick said. Nick pulled an old laptop, held together with duct tape and stickers, from his backpack, plugged it in, and opened up a million pictures. This is where I've been working. He showed us picture after picture of various small houses in different states of construction. There were a lot of pictures of a smiling Nick with a lot of smiling people. A lot were of him shirtless and helping on a house or digging a trench, and one had him roasting marshmallows with several friends. That's embarrassing, the grandmother whispered to Caroline. He doesn't wear any clothes, and the ones he is wearing are rags. Nick had traveled to much of the world, had met so many people, and helped them. I rubbed my arm and leaned in to watch better. A small part of my soul opened up and became restless. This was the life I wanted. Can't you find someone to help who isn't so... Homeless, the grandmother muttered. In almost all of them, Nick was helping somebody or building something. Some were obvious selfies. Others were ridiculous poses. And in all of them, the people seemed happy. Nick seemed happy. Did I dare live a life like that? Why did you leave Africa? Philip asked. There was a coup and the State Department said it wasn't safe for Americans to stay, Nick said, taking a bite of his burger. So I thought now would be a good time to see my family for a week, then head out again. There is this place on one of the South Sea Islands that could use a hand. They got hit by a tropical cyclone pretty hard and need some help building shelters and restoring electricity and water. You travel around the world helping people? Who pays for the travel? I asked, leaning in to get a closer look. I pressed the space bar a couple of times to bring up new pictures. Next were before and after picture of a house being built. Nick by some kind of tree. Nick with some guy that could be a boyfriend or a co-worker. Nick playing soccer with a group of friends. Nick smiling in front of an amazing sunset. The people I work for pay travel expenses, as long as you commit to six months. 
Sometimes I get a say in where I go, sometimes they do. Either way, I see the world and help people, Nick said, eating a couple of fries in one bite. They? I asked. The World Aid and Charity Society. It's kind of like the Peace Corps, but it's run by a group of philanthropists. It's a volunteer agency that sends people all over the world. Sometimes it's short-term relief, like helping people after a hurricane, or long-term, like what I was doing in Africa, building houses and water systems. If you're interested, they have a website that gives all the details, Nick said. He grabbed a paper towel and wrote a website on it, and almost handed it to me. He pulled the paper back and wrote a phone number on it. Next to that, he wrote his initials. The phone number had a Nevada area code. Nick gave me a chin lift as he handed it to me. I bet that number was his. Did I dare call it? Did he just smile? It sounds fascinating, I said, tucking the paper in my pocket. It's not, Carolyn said. A coup? It's not safe for Americans? What's next? Are you getting shot at? You will quit that job immediately and come home and settle down. You are done traveling. It's time to find a wife, maybe go to school. You will stay here and get a real job. Nick went quiet and the smile disappeared. Why did I think this time would be any different? Mom, you can't control me anymore. You will do as I say because I am your mother and I know what's best, Carolyn said. Mom, now isn't the time, Amy said. Let your mom say her piece, because she will anyway, and I agree with her, Philip said. This again? Mom, Dad, we've had this discussion before. I'm gay, and I'm not planning on getting married. I like to travel and help people. I like working with my hands, and I like what I do. I'll never be rich. I'll never give you grandkids. When will you figure out that this is my life, not yours, Nick said. At least I'm thinking about your future, Carolyn said. Don't you mean the future you have planned for me, Nick said. How can you be happy flitting all over the world, the grandmother said. I had your mom and your uncle by the time I was your age. Your grandfather worked hard to feed us. It's time you married and had kids. Mom, Dad, Grandma, Grandpa, it's like this every time I come home. So why did I even bother? This is my life, Nick said, and tapped the picture of him and the sunset. He turned to look at me. Brody, is that your car out front? It is, I said. Can you drop me off at a hotel? Nick said. I've got your bed already made up, Carolyn said. You're staying here. Brody, Nick said. When do you want to go? I asked. You can't leave, Carolyn said. I have a girl coming over I want you to meet. We've set up the living room especially for you two, the grandmother said. I'm not spending the next week with you and Mom, nagging me about my life. You did that enough when I was growing up, Nick said. He looked at his mother and rose, packed his laptop in his bag, and left a half-finished burger behind. Thanks for helping me remember why I don't come by more often. Brody, I'll wait out front. You can't be serious, Amy said. You have a responsibility to your family. Another victim of mom's and grandma's brainwashing. I thought you were smarter than that, Amy. Learn to think for yourself, Nick said. Mom, did you hear what he said? Tell him he can't talk to me like that, Amy said. Nick disappeared into the house, and a moment later, the front door opened and closed. That was rude of him, his grandmother said. If he's going to act all independent, then good riddance. Now, Brody, when you marry Amy, don't act rude like that. Be a good boy and listen to us. Excuse me, I said. I wrapped my burger in a paper towel and took it with me. Call me later, Amy said, sweetly smiling and rapidly blinking her eyes. Will do, I said. But after I do a lot of thinking. I went through the house and out front. Nick was playing with the dog. He gave it one last scratch on the ears. Ready, I said. Cosmo's the real reason I came back. He doesn't lecture. I miss the guy, Nick said. Nick shut the dog up in the house as I put his suitcase in the trunk. I pulled away from the curb as Nick adjusted his pack. I don't know how serious you and Amy are, but I would rethink marrying into that family if I were you. 
You either fit their status quo or they make you fit. That's why I left. I refuse to fit, Nick said quietly. Why does everybody think Amy and I are getting married? I have never even asked her, I blurted out. You stick around mom and she'll have you two married in a month and nag you about kids the month after, Nick said. I had the sinking feeling that Nick was right. Time to change the subject before I get depressed. What will you do now? I asked. I've got some friends I can visit, some old places I can see. I haven't been back here for a year, so I'm going to make the most of the week I'm here, Nick said. I wanted to see more of the world Nick saw. It made me feel like a kid watching fireworks. What if I could travel like Nick? What if I could be as free as he was? I wanted to learn more about him, about his life, about what he did. Maybe I could learn to help people, or at least learn to travel. What would it be like to kiss him? Down boy, get your mind off his lips. I have an extra room, and it's yours if you show me all the pictures and tell me all the stories. It's a lot cheaper than a hotel, I said. I don't know if a week is enough time to tell everything, Nick said, smiling. Then you'll have to talk fast, I said. Nick smiled that genuine smile, brushed his fingers through his sun-bleached hair, and nodded. Brody, throw in a beer and it's a deal. We went back to my apartment and I got out some spare blankets and pillows and changed into old shorts and an older t-shirt. Nick had also changed, set up his laptop, and for the next few hours he showed me some of the places he had visited. One set of pictures showed him climbing ruins in Mexico. Another set showed him in Paris climbing the stairs on the Eiffel Tower, and more were of him in various parts of Africa. We talked for hours about the places he'd been, the people he'd met, odd stories about the people he worked with. My life sounds boring compared to yours, I said. Not boring, just different. Tell me about you, Nick asked. My phone rang. I picked it up. Brody, I am so sorry my brother was so rude, Amy said. He's always been like that, and no matter what Mom tried, he had to do things his way. He is so selfish. Nick was sitting next to me, heard everything, and rolled his eyes. Amy, I've been thinking about us, I said. Are you ready to set a date, she said. I made a decision on the spot. I don't want to live the life your mom and you have planned for me. What? Is this because of my stupid brother? Amy yelled. I saw how you treated your brother, I said. I don't want to have to wear perfect clothes every time I see your parents, or say the perfect things, or act a certain way. I don't want to have your family dictate when and if I get married, or how many kids I have, or where I live, or what I choose to do. I'm not marrying your grandma, or your mom, and it looks like you're turning into them. Are you saying we're through? she yelled. I'm saying you need to find somebody else for your family to control, because it's not going to be me. Goodbye, Amy. Grandma was right about you, she screamed, and before she ended the call, she yelled, Mom, Brody dumped me. Nick quickly closed his mouth, but a small half-grin tickled the side of his mouth. It's nice to know it's not just me they want to control, he said. I got up, went to the fridge, and got him another beer. For a second, our hands touched. What would it be like to travel like Nick does? If he ever offered, did I dare travel with Nick? Did I dare kiss him? I've barely met him, and I'm fantasizing about him? I need a cold shower. After I made up the couch for Nick and went to bed, I laid in bed a long time thinking about life. Around two, I got up to get something to drink. I found some leftover juice and pizza in the fridge and took them with me. Nick had taken the blankets and pillows to the floor and snored away. His laptop was still on, displaying the last picture. As shirtless, Nick smiled as he stood on the roof of a half-finished house. I sat in front of the computer and hit the spacebar over and over again, visiting picture after picture. What would it be like to be so free, to see the world? Would I dare ever do it? Nick, 
his friends, the people, smiled in almost every picture. His passport and wallet were on the table. Making sure he was asleep, I opened his passport. It held at least a dozen stamps to countries all over the world. I don't even have a passport. Is there such a thing as passport envy? Nick would think I was a complete creep for looking at his life, at his thousands of pictures. His life was so different from my life. I wanted that difference. I clicked the space bar and shuffled through more pictures and more pictures. How would it be? I whispered. I've never been to Italy or England, Nick whispered, half asleep. He levered himself up on one elbow. If you could go anywhere, where would it be? I don't know how you do it, traveling alone. I couldn't do that. I dare you to dream, he said. I'll have to think about it. Sorry, I said. Good night. All through work the next day, I daydreamed about traveling, about helping people, about Nick, the way he smiled at anything, or laughed, or the way his clothes smelled of cinnamon. Where would I go if I could go anywhere? Tokyo? Cairo? London? After work, we visited his friends at Lupe's Bar and Grill. Nick showed some of the pictures I'd already seen, but I never tired of looking at them. Or him. We went through more pictures when we got home, and he told me even more stories behind each picture, and about the organization he worked for. What would it be like to kiss those lips? Have you figured out where you'd go yet? Nick asked. Seoul? Venice? Washington, D.C.? Every day, I couldn't wait to get home to see him. I told myself I only wanted to hear about his life, hear about other countries. But I wanted to hear his voice, be near him, because he made me feel like I was on an adventure, like I could be independent. I wanted to live. Nick made me feel alive. On the way home from work, I stopped by the drugstore and spent a little extra and picked up black condoms and a bottle of good Merlot. Then I stopped by the grocery store and picked up a things for a special dinner. The night before I would drive Nick to the airport for his flight, I made bacon-wrapped filet mignon, oven-roasted asparagus with pearl onions and root vegetables, and chocolate-drizzled cheesecake. We sat at the table, in old shorts and t-shirts, poring over pictures, I think Nick suspected something when I served the wine. He smiled when I gave him the filet mignon, and we fed each other pieces of bacon. For music, I had found a long play video with a tribal beat. I took a breath and placed my hand on his. Nick glanced down, but didn't move his hand away. My heart beat faster. I held a piece of bacon in my lips. I leaned in, my lips close to his. Would Nick move away? I moved in closer until our lips were only an inch apart. Did I dare kiss him? I had wanted to since we had fallen on top of each other. Nick smiled and took the bacon from me with his lips. Our first kiss. His breath smelled of bacon and Merlot. Mine probably did as well. Like the rest of his body, his lips were beautiful and adventure. Nick woke the passion inside me and I wanted to be with him for a lot longer than tonight, our last night. But he left tomorrow for the South Seas. I broke our kiss long enough to bring in the cheesecake. Nick chuckled and gently bit his lip. He kissed me as I sat down. He fed me a bite, smiling. I fed him, trying not to giggle. I smudged a little on your lips. Let me clean it up, I said. But I hadn't. But it gave me an excuse to kiss him. Or was he kissing me? The doorbell rang. Worst timing ever, Nick said, groaning and sitting back. Amy was at the door, wearing another brand new dress, batting her fake lashes and bearing chocolate chunk cookies. I decided you needed one more chance, she said. Come in, I said. Your mom decided or you decided? When do I get to decide? That's not fair, Amy said. Her eyes narrowed when she saw Nick sitting at my table, surrounded by the filet mignon, the bacon, the wine, the partially eaten cheesecake. 
The music switched to a slow beat tribal techno. Amy, I said, I'll live my life the way I want. Nick, this is your fault, she said. Actually, it's yours, I said. Someday stand up to your family. Be your own person, not your mom's puppet. You are rude. I can't believe I considered marrying you. She whirled and was out the door, taking the cookies with her. Did I break your relationship? Nick asked. You opened my eyes, I said, and sat next to Nick, holding his hand. Can I ask you something? What's that? Nick asked. I kissed him before daring to speak. I know you leave tomorrow. Could we share something special tonight? What? Nick whispered, pulling me close. I broke away long enough to pull a black condom from my pocket. My cheeks felt so warm, and I quickly glanced at Nick and looked away. I set the condom on the table. Nick picked up the condom and winked at me. Your bed or mine? The alarm woke us both, and we kissed before shutting it down. For breakfast, we had the leftover cheesecake. I drove Nick to the airport. We had a few minutes before we had to go inside. We hugged. I had an amazing week, I said. You always can stay with me if you're ever in town. I tucked one of the black condoms in his pocket, along with my phone number. If you're ever in the same part of the world I am, come find me, Nick said. A last kiss, and he had to go. I watched him disappear into the airport, then stayed and watched his plane take off. I drove slowly back to my apartment. The empty seat in my car reminded me of him, and I ran my hand over it. My laptop reminded me of all the hours we looked at pictures and talked. A man ran with their dog. That reminded me of Cosmo and the day I tackled Nick. Nick had brought adventure into my life. I wasn't going to lose that, or him. Nick gave me a paper that had a website on it, and his number. Did I dare follow him? A wild lightness filled me. I dared. Nick called me from Honolulu, then called me again from his next stop, then again after he landed somewhere else. Nick didn't have a cell tower by him, but they did have a satellite phone. We talked once every two weeks for five minutes. Occasionally he had internet, and he emailed me pictures of where he was working, and the smiling and laughing people he worked with. His posting turned out to be a long-term assignment. Probably a year. I couldn't wait that long to see him. The first thing I needed was a passport. Two months and one week later, I got off the plane with nothing more than a suitcase, a duffel, and a backpack. The place was hot and humid and beautiful with skies that stretched into infinity. I couldn't understand the language, and it took a day to find a ride to the village Nick worked in. It took another two hours along bumpy roads before we got to the remains of a coastal village that a cyclone had almost destroyed. I climbed out of the truck and looked for Nick. He stood on the half-finished roof of the church, shirtless, tan, and hair as sun-bleached as I remembered. A tool belt slung low on his hips, and he held a hammer. Hey, Nick, I yelled, holding a black condom package. I decided where I want to go. He turned, looked for the voice, and saw me. He dropped his jaw and his hammer and bit his knuckle. The biggest grin crossed his face as his eyes teared. Oh, my God. Brody, you're here? I had to wipe my eyes as well. He was ground level in seconds, and he hugged me and kissed me and held me and kissed me again. We both cried. The other workers cheered. I don't believe you're here, he said, crying. Where did you want to go? Wherever you are, I whispered through my tears, but I'm going to need some help with the sunscreen. It took a few weeks, but the church was the first building we finished. The old minister stood at the front of a packed church while Nick and I held hands. We wore matching Hawaiian shirts, and we couldn't stop grinning. Neither Nick nor I could understand him, and a translator told us what he said and told him what we said back. Nick and I were the first couple married in the restored church, and the people of the village had a seafood extravaganza on the beach afterwards. We spent our wedding night in a hut on the beach, the surf crashing outside. 
Later, when Nick and I looked at the pictures of our time helping the village, I smiled as much as he did. Maybe more. I'm glad I dared. Thank you everybody for listening. I appreciate it. Peace.